So welcome to this session on PCI device authentication and encryption. Now, Lucas is remote, and this is primarily his topic to drive. Um, so I'm just sort of going to act as compare in the room and throw microphones at people. Um, given the whole point here is to have a deep discussion, if it turns out to be easier for someone to leg it up here and speak into this microphone, feel free. Um, if not, we'll, we'll be throwing the mics around. So uh, over to you, Lucas. OK, thanks a lot. Um, so am I audible? Hang on, Lucas. Or... You're, you're a bit quiet. Give it a sec. Okay. Again? One, two, three, four. Is that good? That's better. Thank you very much. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so let's start. Um, quick, quick overview of the agenda. Um, I have submitted some patches back in September. I wanted to give a quick recap on that. I wanted to talk about what's coming up after that. And um, we have some controversies that I would like to discuss. And uh, hopefully we will be able to reach alignment on that. So this is about uh, PCI device authentication and encryption. And uh, it turns out there is a generic uh, protocol for that. Uh, which was designed by the DMTF. It's called Security Protocol and Data Model. So that's a generic protocol for authentication, for measurement retrieval, and for setting up an encrypted channel to a device. And the PCI SIG has simply adopted that specification among several other um, consortiums. So the CXL consortium has also adopted it naturally. And I think SATA and SCSI are also looking into supporting that or encapsulating SPDM packets. Uh, one crucial limitation of SPDM is that uh, there can only be one entity in the system uh, which communicates with the device you know, over SPDM. There can only be a single SPDM session. Uh, that's a crucial limitation which will uh, which is causing a lot of headache for us, uh, as, as will become apparent soon. So um, going to the next slide here. So we can decide who is responsible for the SPDM session, who is handling the authentication and the measurement retrieval and all that. Uh, one way to do it is to give the, um, to give that, to hand that over to the OS kernel. And the other option is to have a security module inside the CPU do that. Uh, commonly, this is called a TSM, uh, Trusted Security Module. So the Intel implementation is called TDX Connect and AMD is calling that SEVTIO. Everyone has something proprietary. Um, the idea is that so either either the kernel talks to the device or that uh, security module inside the CPU, but not not both. Uh, that's because of that protocol limitation. Um, what what we what I am looking or, or what I am primarily interested in is the first approach, um, letting the kernel handle that. One advantage is that we we can have seamless integration with. Uh, reset recovery. So every time uh, we have a DPC event or we issue a secondary bus reset, uh, we automatically perform re-authentication with a device. And likewise, when the, the system resumes from D3 cold or the device runtime resumes from D3 cold, um, we automatically um, re-authenticate the device and make sure that it hasn't changed or that it's not malicious because every time it, it gets a reset, it could be a different device. Um, Lucas, we got a question. Okay. Well, not, not a question, a comment. Uh, uh, to add more good points to, to this first approach is that essentially it can be transport independent, meaning that the same code can also handle SCSI and ATA. Right. If yep. we go to the right. second one, it's going to be way harder. So, so this is separating the SPDM sort of library layer and all of the stuff for that side of things from the actual transport. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes but, sense. But yep. but but also, I would say it's it's not a zero sum game. Like you you can you can also talk to the TSM in 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 those 
in those flows, uh, but also, but but for sharing code, you can also share code. Like, so yeah. the native implementation need not give way, like we, we the kernel can do both. And, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, the problem I see is that most of these implementations which are designed to run uh, on a TSM are primarily targeted towards the uh, confidential computing use case. So they want to attest, uh, they want to perform attestation of a device which is passed through to a guest. That's, I think, the, the prim primary motivation for letting the TSM handle SPDM. And uh, the APIs of these uh, TSMs are, are geared towards that. And I think they do not allow the same degree of freedom that we have if we do this in the kernel. Okay. Um, another issue is, so, uh, measurements on uh, that are so the, the SPDM protocol allows measurements to change at runtime for whatever reason. I don't know what they what they were thinking, uh, but the protocol allows that. And uh, so it's necessary if you want to make sure that you always have uh, fresh measurements, you have to retrieve them on demand. We can do that at the kernel, but uh, the APIs provided for confidential computing are relatively rigid. So it is probably a bit difficult to achieve the same functionality with those APIs. Um, another yeah, I'll, 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 yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say real quick, like we, we, I think Linux needs to think very hard about the idea that you would measure something and then it changes behind your back, that, that, we, would, that we would support that. Like it, this needs to be, considered in very specific circumstances like the security properties of taking a measurement and not being able to trust that measurement are are pretty large you can still trust it it just if you do something it might change That's not trust, right? well it's still trusted it's just different yeah. I mean, <laughs> you've got a lot of different measurements this isn't just one measurement this is yeah. a whole set so it, it's more than plausible some of them reflect things like the firmware version etc and some of them might reflect like debug know, status some... and stuff. Hmm? Right, hmm. right. But 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 if if you if you place trust in a parameter, and mm -hmm. that and then the next time you read that parameter, the parameter has changed. What happened to your trust? But that's why I think you have protocols like TDISP, right? So if you if you validated an endpoint that has TDISP, and it info is going to enforce the TDISP verbs, right? Then you know that if it's the firmware gets updated, it's going to revoke the SPDM sure. session. That yeah, yeah, that's the sort of protocol, right? And it's going to default back to an error state or an unlocked state, and then you have yeah. to reestablish trust in it again. So, so as long as you have that that protocol endpoint that you validated on the first time you validated, authenticated the device and validated the trust in it, then you can enforce a, an upgrade model on top of that. He just puts an amusing line in it that says, you must have a security professional who knows what they're doing <laughs> when you specify what can change and what changes the measurements. Yeah, my, my, my only point is that if, if you go through the error state to get back to get the new measurements, that's, that's not retrieving fresh measurements. That's starting over. Yeah, actually, actually, there is, there is, it is even possible that uh, certificates might change behind our back because um, the protocol allows that you can not only talk to the device over DOE, but uh, someone, uh, a baseband controller might talk to the device over MCTP and they might change, uh, they might provision a new certificate and we're not aware about it. And so it is in principle, the protocol allows that, that certificates are provisioned behind our back. Uh, that's another yep. snag of this protocol. That, that, that's okay as long as we don't remove any, because that's just in the category of, well, something would work if you tried again and we don't, <laughs> Try again, so we don't care. Um, yeah. So that one, I don't think is too bad. You just, if you revoked a certificate or, or removed it from the device, then you'd really want it to drop out of TDIS. I think that's definitely in the don't do it category. Uh, Jerome? So. Well, it's been a while since I read the spec TDX and, and AMD1. Um, I thought that the API they were providing the TSM, they were providing will allow you to run, send any command you want, any SPDM command you want to the device. And it is like going to be a follow up from the 
from the guest to the device through the TSM. It's not as flexible as any command so far, but it's not particularly tightly defined, I think. So go ahead. I've got, oh, hang on. It's, it, I've got a more, with the mic first. <laughs> a more general question. I mean, when you say two roads diverged, as in you're asking if we have to make a choice here or it's something that we need to take for granted and just do it. I mean, because I don't think there is a choice there. I mean, some for some reason we want SPDM to be handled in a security model inside a CPU. And well, if it has to be handled in the kernel, it's it's a separate choice. But I mean, That's... what I don't get if it's if we are discussing about two possibilities, but the reason, I mean, we just need to do both and that's the need to coexist. That's correct. Uh, uh, they, they can't completely coexist, which is the bit that causes you trouble because you can only have one session open, but you, yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. a policy decision to make for what do you care about right now? Yeah, well, so, okay, that was the question. Then, well, I don't want to jump the gun, but all, I don't know if it's all the story of behind DOE being PCI config space and shared. It's been sorted if it can be sorted or not. But I think it's uh, yeah, yeah, that one that one's still open. If but the, the nature of these TSMs, etc., talking is they are still talking through the host kernel. They're just passing sure. stuff that the host kernel can't mm -hmm. interpret. So it's all no, proxied. There are some. There are some other nasty problems with things accidentally trampling on the DOEs because they may be doing something entirely different. And there's no way of finding out what they do without querying the whatever it is, the discovery protocol, which can kill your SPDM session. Yeah. Well, okay, but I want to just understand if we are deciding, okay, it's not doing that in the security model is not the way to go. I mean, there is no well, no, no, there no, is no choice no, no. there. I mean, if it's like that, it's like that. Yeah. I mean, I think the aim the aim here today, and Lucas, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the aim here is to, if possible, establish if there are any problems with a a policy based type decision where all of these routes are enabled and we make sure that everything that looks should look the same looks the same and all that sort of stuff um but we can make the decision depending on what you're actually doing with it um and what your use case is right so i was going to talk about that on the next slide i was just oh, uh, sorry. no 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 problem oh, we've got one more question okay uh, on this slide <laughs> What the hell is the reason for not supporting virtual functions? Because in virtualization, that's pretty much what we're going to pass up to the virtual machine. And it ah, sounds right. like the protocol would operate much more easily if you supported them. OK, so, so the thing on virtual yeah. functions, do you want to do this, Lucas? You go for it. Yeah, uh, so the PCI spec permits that uh, each virtual function has a DOE uh, capability and that allow that uh, in that case it is possible that you can have a separate spdm session which with each uh, virtual function the problem is the pci spec permits that it doesn't prescribe that so it's optional um, to be honest we've we've exactly we've not heard of anyone doing it yet if anyone wants to stick their arm up and say they are doing it from a vf oh we got one <laughs> so we definitely need to support that which means we definitely need an internal stack because there's no other way of doing it um Super. Hey, wait for the mic, wait for the mic, because Lucas can't hear you. Oh, yeah. oh boy. Uh, we, we have been, uh, I will say, looking at the spec uh, and looking at SROV and uh, interested in combining the two for future use cases. That sounds good. So, so there may be some. If, if you have any opportunity to push people to do it, it does make life so much simpler. Um, from some of the cases, because you don't have to go through anywhere near as many calls down into your trusted module, because you could just talk to the device, which which would be lovely. But yeah, but, it's optional. But but but, but Jonathan, the, the the native kernel stack was never in threat. So like when you're saying we we don't need the VF case to justify the native native kernel stack. Like we're we're doing native kernel stack no matter what. The the answer to that is yeah I think we got to that point in last year's birds of a feather we established that it, it, there were necessary use cases having more of them is always useful for at least motivating us moving a bit quicker okay. um, pe more people care which we always like okay uh, any further questions or we're good for now I think no hands up okay okay um yeah so one one drawback of the native kernel uh, based approach is that um, you need help from either the host or from the tsm to set up encryption the problem is uh, the encryption ide encryption is uh, symmetric so you have to program a key both into the device in the endpoint device 
end into the root port. So programming the key into the endpoint device from a confidential VM is perfectly possible. Uh, as if the if that guest is has control of the SPDM session, because that is exchanged over SPDM. The problem is programming the key into the root port. You need help either from the from the host or from the TSM to do that. That's another, that's one drawback of the uh, native approach. And of course, the TSM approach has the drawback that you have to trust a blob uh, which is provided by the CPU vendor. And so in the case of Intel, uh, the source code is actually public, but it's not a free software. Is there a question? Yep, there is not a question, but the it, it's not always a blob. So <laughs> that, that's it's, it's, it, it can be open source. And uh, okay. on RISC-5, for example, we are providing uh, uh, an open source implementation of yep. the equivalent of a TSM. So it's something that you can audit, review, modify, contribute to uh, the same way that you can do that with a Linux kernel. Yep. Hi. Hey, that's so, a good so, point. Is uh, so are some others who we have, we have a whole list now. Go on, yeah, Drew. I believe even some x86 vendor actually have, have released some of the TDX or ICD module. I don't know. Yeah, it's open source. Yeah. 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 I'm just throwing another quick clarification. It isn't actually strictly necessary under the spec to involve a TSM in setting up IDE. It's just that no one's actually built the version where you talk to an SPDM session in the root port itself in order to set the connection up because it's crazy heavy. Uh, Ooh, just, sounds like someone might have done. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add that even the PSP firmware source code is. I was going to say is that a lot of these are not open source. They're source available, and there's a very mm -hmm. different use case for that. The mm -hmm. Intel one, you to read the source code, but you won't be able to compile it and put your own in, fix bugs, add functionality or anything, because it's all signed by an Intel key you don't have. And now you can say AMD does the same. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you can audit it and be fairly sure it's what you think it is. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say we, we can applaud, <laughs> we need to applaud the, the Risk Five effort because that puts pressure on the other vendors to open up their TSM uh, code. So, um, so I, as a, again, I submitted a series in September for device authentication. Uh, my goal is to respin that this quarter. I would like to say that this is a joint effort by multiple vendors. Uh, so that uh, that involves Jonathan from Huawei. That involves me from Intel. It involves um, Alistair and uh, Wilfred, who are in the back, I think, from Western Digital. Hello. And um, so it's a joint multi-vendor effort. And I think that's important. Uh, it's not just a single vendor trying to shoehorn their code into upstream. It's multiple vendors collaborating and uh, having a joint interest in this. Um, so I'm proposing a solution for this issue we have just discussed. Um, I think so my, my, my proposal is that initially the host OS kernel would be responsible for authenticating the device and it would, um, it would expose measurements in SysFS. But once a device is passed through to a guest, um, it would uh, relinquish control of the SPDM session. And from that point on, the TSM would be responsible. That would be my proposal and I would offer a library calls um, which are called from KBM for example um, to get control of the SPDM session that would be my proposal for this are there any comments does anyone have any comments on that there's a few comments <laughs> well this does not work with PCI this because if I'm more correctly um, so if you set up PCI this with an SPDM session and then you stop that SPM session and do a new SPM session, then the PCI series block the device and the uh, device don't. No, no, because no. you haven't, when you've done it in the initial kernel, well, you haven't entered lock state. So there's no error state. You're still just doing CMA. Uh, then you redo the whole thing again. There's a bit of duplication. Yeah, but uh, so, so if you give one device to a VM, yeah. one VF to a VM, yeah. that one enter lock state, that one is running. Yes. Then you give another VF of that same physical device to a different VM. 
that want to do another SPDM. No, 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 no. You, you, you hand it over once. I agree that maybe the terminology here of doing it, this isn't implying you do it for each one, you do it on the first one. So the first time, okay, so you if know you're doing only, on, only once, that works. But if you do yeah. it multiple times, it doesn't work. Yes. Uh, well, you, you hand over control specifically of the, the, the little bit of the PF and then the locks requirements that come with the PF driver that you, you don't run into any problems. I, there's not much else we think we can do. But. I just want to mention that this, this proposed solution to get back to the previous slide, it, it's basically a solution that allows for the two solution, the, the two proposals to actually coexist. Yeah. Right. So this is very useful and yeah. And, and, Yes. The, the question Thanks. here is where where do you squirt in policy on um, what you're actually going to do, and you you could put the policy before and not bother trying to do the kernel first version where you you, you say hi who are you, or you could say well, oh. well we'll we'll do that we'll have a look at the result did it fail have we not got the cert well we've now got a policy decision that says actually we didn't need that one to pass don't worry about it um, which lets us do it a bit earlier where you then still be able to assign it or you might say well actually. I don't want to assign a device. I don't want to use a device at all in any way if the, the hypervisor is not happy that device is good. I mean, yeah. that's not a security attack. It's just a little bit more paranoia. Rick, yeah, it, it, it's kind of the, uh, in, on, that, on that topic, the, 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 flow is, the flow is the same on the host. And, and you can do that on the host. You can do that on the guest, on a confidential guest. The flow is going to be the same where you're gonna you're gonna probe the device from the host. You're gonna if you if you want to test it, you're gonna test it, and if you want to accept it, you're gonna accept it. But the, the the flow is gonna be the same, and you can you can say, if I see it from the host, I'm gonna I'm gonna authenticate it, test it, and accept it, and it's gonna be owned by the host until someone decides that I'm gonna ask a KVM to actually reclaim that device because I want to pass it to a a, a confidential VM. Like the, the concept of accept doesn't make quite the same sense for the host because it can't engage in the rest of TDIS. Why not? Can't deal with, we can't deal with the TBIT. What's that? Uh, the host, the, well, okay, in the implementations that exist, it, the host it, is it, never yeah. capable of setting the TBIT. So no, nothing that's actually going to the device is appropriately marked. Yep. You, you could, could do the rest of the flow, it's just a, yeah. a chit chat. Current, I mean, just current implementation, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so. The thing I say is, is is I, I agree we need to be, have a dynamic switch over, but it, it may not even need to be this granular. Like you could you could have a policy that says if you if you have a TSM, try to use it, and if you don't want to use your TSM, then set set a policy never to use never use a TSM. And if the TSM says I don't like this thing, you can you can say do I want to fall back to native or not? And if TSM's not there, you use native all the time. So like it, like we don't it, it may not even need to be like live dynamic. It could just be a boot time policy like we have for. For ACPI things, where you say we trust the ACPI thing, or we do our, or we do it ourselves, and this is, it's just an override. Yeah, one concern I have is around IDE. So one of the things people have said with IDE is it's not necessarily the case that you have enough encryption contexts. So and there's also a horrible performance problem with IDE. Uh, that encryption is painful. If you have a device, you might want to go through an authentication thing and say, well, actually, I never gave it to a confidential VM. Don't do the encryption. <laughs> it's going to cost me a lot of performance. Um, maybe in those circumstances, we need to have another layer of policy that says, well, okay, I've either run out of encryption context or whatever, but you may, the, the question as well is whether the TSMs have the lighter weight request, which is, please just do the IDE setup for me. I mean, just SPDM. No, the, just SPDM. The, no, the, the, well, uh, it's a bit more than SPDM. It's the IDE bit that's on top of that. So you've got to do key exchange, et cetera. Whereas, yeah, you've got to send the relevant messages to actually bring the keys up to get the encryption started. Yes, you've got to do that first. There's a bit more. Yeah, but you, you mean a lightweight as in do only SPDM, but not not, not the rest team? of TDIS. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you don't care about lockdown states. You don't care about any of that sure. because you're not doing confidential compute. You just want to encrypt your link. Yeah. So you want to do ID over SPDM and, and stop there. Yeah. 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 But you, you yeah. can. Yeah. That that. Well, that then, has to be. That has to actually. I mean, the interfaces that have been discussed so far for the TSMs, have, as far as I've noticed, have never considered that simpler case. It, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the interfaces that uh, Alexa is, has been proposing, they, mm -hmm. there's one verb that is connect, which is exactly this. Connect basically establish the SPDM session, creates the, uh, the IDE um, a key exchange, yeah. establish IDE okay. and stops there. Okay. I thought that left you in a state where DMA was disabled. 
from his description. But that may just be because he was talking about the confidential exactly. version. It may be that it's fine if you, you turn it on. If you if you do yeah. confidential, then you, yeah, you want sure. DMA to be safe. On the okay, cool. I mean, from the from the TDS perspective, um, and from TIO's perspective, once you connect to a device, the device still behaves as if it's a legacy device. You have to go through the binding operation before DMA and MMIO gets blocked and such. So you could conceivably consider a case where the connect verb has a connect light kind of command where you say, do the, do the SPDM IDE exchange and set everything up then. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, that basically solves that problem. So cool. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's also important to know that not every device supports attestation. So the, there is a TEIO supported bit in the device capabilities register in config space. And if that bit is not set, the device does not support attestation. So in that case, you cannot use TDISP and all that. And uh, if so, in that case, it might be that um, the OS kernel driven SPDM session is the only option. Uh, of course, it, it might be possible to somehow use the API of the TSM to also achieve the same functionality, but it's it's not a given. They, they were designed for a different purpose. Wait, so when you say attestation, um, yeah. do you, I mean, attestation is built into the to SPDM. It's, you know, without even without TDIS, but attestation is there. That's the get measurements command. So if it supports, uh, I believe, CMA, you support attestation. Um, no, it's so uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. I was so when I say attestation, it means that the TSM attests uh, or provides a report and attests, for example, that it has um, configured the IOMMU in a specific way and uh, all that. that. That's what I refer yeah. to. Yeah, that's that's more of the the the, the uh, you know the, the host side TDISP stuff, um, right? But for attestation, if you're trying to look for attestation reports, that's part of just plain vanilla okay. SPDM. Okay. Yeah. Sure. If you okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Technically, it's optional to do measurement. Um, in practice, what did you do it for? If you don't, I mean, but, yeah, that's right. You could yeah. ignore the the attestation report and just turn everything on. Yeah, I mean, you could you could just rely on the certificate and say, well, this thing has no configuration. It's a very, very dumb device, so there's no point in measuring anything. Yeah. Um, and then you're okay. Okay. Hey. Um, so this uh, patch set that I'm submitted and that, that I'm going to respin, uh, this just provides authentication. So you have a keyring in the kernel, and you can add certificates to that keyring using the key CTL command. And um, then you, there is a file in SysFS called authenticated. And if you echo, if you, if you cat that uh, that attribute, um, it says one for authenticated or zero for not authenticated. And there are some uh, diagnostics in DMASK. Um, and you can also echo one to that authenticated file to initiate re-authentication. So for example, if you have added a certificate to the keyring, you can just echo one to that file and it will re-authenticate the device or it, it, it will attempt to do that. That's the sole functionality of that patch set. And um, going forward, I want to talk about what I am what I think I will be working on next. Uh, and that will be measurement retrieval. So I had a lot of, e I've exchanged a lot of emails with Alistair from Western Digital because he has a real real life use case for this. Um, I don't know how much I can say about that. Uh, maybe Alistair was, wants to talk about it himself. I don't know. Um, basically, the idea is to expose, for example, a firmware version um, and uh, a, a cloud service provider might allow only certain firmware versions. And if a CVE is found in an older version, a cloud service provider might want to check uh, which, which uh, firmware versions are currently deployed uh, in a data center. 
And if it turns out, okay, there are devices which have an older version, maybe we want to tolerate that. And if it, if it has this vulnerability, then we need to update it. So there would be a rolling update of all the devices and the devices can be found um, through these measurements, which are exposed in SysFS. Any comments on that? No? Okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, hang on, hang on, microphone being passed. So, not a comment, but a, a question. What do you mean by a measurement indices? Okay, the, what so, is what are the indices for? <laughs> yeah, so the, so that's that's just a term which is used on the SPDM specification. They are saying uh, you, you so you have multiple measurements. You can have up to two hundred fifty four measurements, and uh, they they are calling that index. They are indexed. So you retrieve a number. That's the number of that measurement and they have reserved uh, some of these numbers. So one of these numbers, I don't know which one uh, is for a manifest. So you might want to retrieve that manifest and that manifest might contain information which other measurements might be available. That's that's just a term from the SPDM spec. But, and you know, on, on the, I mean, it, it's completely, I mean, it, it, it's not related to your proposal, but the, it, it basically means that SPDM is proposing yet another attestation format. It's basically an attestation report from SPDM and it's it's yet another format. With a few right. corners, it, it's basically undefined. It's just magic measurement, yeah, yes. um, which you could put in any format that made sense. Sure, but it's, uh, yeah. I, but I think uh, uh, SPDM leaves some space for using other um, uh, Vendor specific or not vendor specific, uh, more standardized uh, attestation report format. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But that's a it's hardware possible. definition yes. problem. It's so a the, device manufacturer decision, yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, so it is possible in principle to support that um, because there is, you have this, um, when, when you when you start the SPDM session, there is some, uh, there is an exchange called negotiate algorithms. And as part of that, uh, the requester provides options of the supported measurement formats and there is currently only one measurement format defined that's the dmtf one so we can only offer that single format and the responder will th then select that so in principle it's possible that the dmtf defines additional uh, measurement formats they just haven't so far and just so i understand the point of these three files the bitstream mm -hmm. is actually the binary data the digest yeah. is the hash the device reports. The type tells you how to hash it. And if you just pass that bit stream into a SHA-256 sum of whatever, it should match the digest. Is that about right? Exactly. Exactly. And okay. the type the type is um, something which is uh, that's part of their DMTF-defined measurement format. So when you retrieve a measurement, you, you also get a type with it. And this could uh, some of these types are like, firmware measurement or whatever they, they have multiple types and it just gives you an information what kind of measurement this is good to go just just a comment uh, uh not really a question and i'll talk with alistair about that but for the the ccfs structure um i i just like would like to make sure that we have everything grouped together in a single attribute group so that we can move or actually use reuse the same group with the same structure with the same everything for different transport again SCSI device ATA device etc yeah. um so yeah. measurements yeah. it's not the top one we'll probably want to have a top directory that says spdm or whatever so that we whatever the name um uh, that's going to get ugly really quickly i mean it's not really a subsystem if it's just providing a few numbers so no, you could, I, you could do so. I mean, it's I, not going I, to be I mean everything related to the SPDM session measurement, etc. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, under a, a single dire, uh, yeah. attribute directory, so that we, we can attach that one to any type of gotcha. device we we that supports SPDM, not just yes. PCI. Uh, that's, so, that's enough, yeah. In other words, when we when we when we support once we support SPDM for SCSI or SATA, you want the same. Uh, exposure in SysFS. I understand. Um, so yes, I have that would be way easier for the users. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I have thought about embedding the SysFS exposure in the SPDM library. The problem is, um, I think I'm not going to do that. I think I will um, put that in the CMA code because uh, when SPDM is controlled, that's the last bullet point on the slide. 
when SPDM is controlled by the TSM, um, I want the these measurements to still work. I want users to still be able to access them. And the way to access them is just um, to look at the report, uh, the device interface report, which was retrieved from the device or which is presented by the TSM. Um, so that's the only option that we have because we, if, if we're not in control of SPDM, we can only use that. So I, I will have basically an, an if clause and uh, if the device is under control of the TSM, I will have to ask, um, or look into the device interface report uh, to get to get to those measurements. That's the only way. So um, I think I, it will not be possible to embed the SysFS exposure in the SPDM library. I will have to put that in CMA, but I don't know. I, I am aware of the problem. I will try to find a solution that um, maybe maybe we can share a code once we need that for other device types, but I'm Lucas, aware of the problem, yeah. It, Lucas, I'd shortcut this. What matters at this point is documentation. Uh, what the implementation is, what refactoring happens, what sharing, that's later, once there are multiple Im implementations. One, one question, uh, Lucas, uh, the, how do you authenticate the, the measurements? Because they are so uh, that's, SPDM. That's or... the, yeah, the, kernel, the kernel does that. So uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you perform the authentication, uh, there are eight uh, certificate slots. And I, I iterate over all these eight slots and try, I retrieve the certificate chain and I try to validate those certificates. I, I test whether they are assigned by one of the keys on that key ring. And uh, once I have found a um, certificate chain that validates, uh, then I use that for the challenge authenticate for the, for the challenge response, which authenticates the device. And that same certificate chain is then used for um, verifying the signature on those measurements. So, so the kernel is responsible for verifying the signature, and you will only uh, all the sig all the measurements in SysFS have been verified by the kernel. Does that answer so your question? You it it does, but you, it also means you don't leave uh, you don't let user space verify the uh, the measurements that it's yeah. yeah 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 okay. So just on looking at the format of these measurements, this is not a criticism of patches. It looks like a criticism of SPDM. We've went been through exactly the same thing with the TPM and its twenty four PCRs. You begin life by thinking that PCR values. Uh, explicitly specify everything in the system. And what you find when stuff starts changing and you start adding pieces is there's this massive combinatoric explosion and you can't tell how the measurement was constructed. Has the uh, SPDM SIG actually thought about this and thought they might need something more like a log that then, you know, uh, hashes to the measurements rather than having single uh, a set of single register yeah, measurements? I think they think it's out of scope. Now, that's not to say they won't take proposals. You, other specs are allowed to define the format. So there are bits and pieces in, get this right, there are bits and pieces in the PCI stuff that are sort of hinted at. But I think their intent is that it's other people's problem to define it for a particular type of situation. But I mean, they may well take stuff. I mean, they're friendly. So, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, the kernel verifying the cert doesn't work for me and, and won't work for No, no, you, uh, that, okay, so, <laughs> from, so you don't want the kernel to verify the cert. Only user space. Why? Because I can only get the necessary information in user space uh, and all the policy and so on. So the, on the next slide, I, I'm talking about exposing the certificate chains. So you do get access to the certificate chains but um, you do not get access to the to the um, signed. Uh, so user space doesn't get access to the challenge response that happens between the kernel and the device. Right, but, but that's not good enough if what we're trying to do is prove to a third party that everything was set up correctly, because then we actually need the signature, the challenge, and the response as part of the evidence we pre present. 
we're, let's say we're trying to prove to it, let's, let's say there's a, a third party attesting to a uh, confidential setup of this device on this platform, either physical or virtual and confidential environment. The uh, remote system that's doing the attestation has to prove to itself that all setup was correct. It can't, and the proof can't just sit in the kernel, it has to be exposed to the attestation system so it can process it and say, yep, everything was set up correctly. Does that attestation system need to inject the nonce? It would, ideally, yes. Okay, so, I mean, exposing it's easy. Uh, it's just a big blob of data, um, the sequence, because it's all used for the final hash anyway. Um, so that bit's easy. It, it's just you're going to need an extra path to, to squirt a nonce in at the beginning and say, use this nonce, off you go, uh, yeah, give me the answer of the whole chain. We're, we're working on a system whereby these attestations can be stored offline and remeasured after the fact, so that there should somewhere exist proof that at a particular time on a particular day, this setup occurred and was correct, and people should be able to go, you know, after a passage of time, go back and actually assess that proof. So, so to me, Lucas, cool. that doesn't sound a particularly heavy lift. I mean, it may not be the thing we do in the first patch set. It might be a follow-up, <laughs> but all of the data's there. I'm just to keep the scope reasonable for getting something in and then come back around for that. Does that sound okay to you, Lucas? Okay to you? Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm taken aback, but... <laughs> no, no one trusts us, Colonel folk. That's what we've established in Confidential Computing. It's not a point about <laughs> trusting something. It's a point about verif getting something yeah, yeah. that satisfies an external <laughs> verifier. And I mean... Mm. All of these problems, uh, the, the, this is slightly annoying because all of these problems have been thought about before by people over decades, and it looks like nobody read the specs of what we do. Yeah, uh, that's fine. This stuff is, is there are TPMs on devices, there are TPMs on the other side of PCI links, there are TPMs going through insane SPDM DOE nonsense. They're, it's all been done before, and we know how all of this works, and you have to take the challenge from the relaying party, you have to run it through all your crypto because that's the proof that you were actually alive when you did the attestation. No, that's fair enough. I it mean, it's, def make... it's definitely a flow. The other flow is local machine checking against certs it already has. It's, it's, it's a different uh... use case, but it's one people still care about. I guess. It, it's, it's the bog standard IMA type case where you're just bringing it up and you've got a cert and you go, oh, is that my hard disk? And then later on, you may go out and get external stuff. So it's the, is it the same as last time question? I guess. I mean, so, sure, I mean, but it's not hard to. But don't you want to also tie well. this to the TPM? Like, shouldn't that really be the point that if if I'm building like a system, a local system only, and it has an encrypted hard drive with the TPM protecting the symmetric key, mm -hmm. shouldn't I check all the PCI devices that I'm going to turn on before I unlock the TPM? And shouldn't I feed that measurement into the TPM? Undoubtedly, but and several steps down the line. <laughs> But the interfaces should expose enough data that that can be yeah. done correctly and securely. No, agreed. But the, the, there's the classic here is if we splat this too wide on the very first getting something in, because um, there's a bunch of bits and pieces to do in the crypto code, et cetera, to get this enabled. We just want start and then absolutely, to my mind, adding exactly what we need is, is a conversation. And then we need, yeah, we need a proof of concept of actually getting into, as you say, to unlock the secrets in the TPM and make sure we didn't forget anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not. It shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> I mean, as I say, the data's all there. I, so. mean, I hear what you're saying, but like, how long has it been, James? Like, TPM stuff has been forever, and we still yeah. don't have we still don't have basic functionality for it in Linux. Like, it's like maybe next year Ubuntu will release an operating system that can do drive unlock with TPM. Like, are you ever going to get there if you don't start yeah. or make it a you know start at and the beginning? Absolutely fair enough. But I mean, there is the point until we have a stack that's clearly using the thing, the chances of getting it wrong is quite high. Because <laughs> we're not as good at this. Maybe we make it your problem to tell us whether we missed something. Uh, uh, which, man, yeah, that works. Works for me, anyway. <laughs> He's trying to get rid of the microphone. I'm going to try to get rid of the microphone. <laughs> Except my piece. So, again, because I want to take notes here. Um, so you want, James, you want, you want to um, input a nonce, and you want to expose... Um, both the challenge and the response. Is that correct? That's correct. So we can transport the all of those pieces of information off the system, verify in some remote place that everything was done correctly. So th this is the essence of remote verification. Okay. I mean, that boils down to the hash chain. 
that you build during the SPDM session to do the no replay protection, because that is absolutely the entire exchange, uh, plus the nonce to squirt in at the right point. So okay. it, it's, it's the stuff the kernel's building in order to get the final hash. Um, anyway, to check that the things are right. So yeah, and I easy. mean, there are people who use just a, a secure random number for the nonce, but it's mm -hmm. always helpful in these systems to actually say the nonce encodes something else to prove a binding. And so that's why you have an input field for the nonce somewhere in the system. Okay. Um, there is a snag here because uh, independently of that, uh, the SPDM protocol allows um, devices that are not able to sign measurements. The protocol allows that. I was wondering, what am I supposed to do in that case? Should I expose the measurements at all, or should I force user space to opt into unsigned measurements? There could be a sysctl option that user space has to explicitly set, either a global option or a per device option to opt into unsigned measurements, or should I just expose these uh, 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 an, ad, an attribute which which kind of says, okay, these measurements are not necessarily trustworthy because they are. Uh, just don't put the digest file. So no digest file inside the directories and it's not signed. Uh, so the digest is just a hash of the bit stream as. Oh, is that just it's not a signature. I mean, there's, no signature. there's two options here. I mean, the, the simplest one is Linux takes the view that's crazy and just refuses to expose them, and we hope no device defender builds them. Um, if they... Uh, no, no one likes that? Device, just don't know how to use it. Oh, okay. Because at least you know it's there, but it's bad. Oh, you always know it's there in PCI. You just don't know. <laughs> okay, so print big, rude error messages um, <laughs> to try and put people off. Taint the kernel while we're there. We already have... Like, if you're building these devices to get this kind of security, the signing keys to, to do all this signing and measurement are only on production devices that only run production software. All of the development team does not have access to those keys. And do they not use a test key? They, that is they, not the... they do something else, right? But it may not be in these key rings. It may become okay. very difficult to use a test device in Linux if you put too many blockades in the way. There's always policy. You can just ignore this completely. We're not saying yeah. the driver won't bind, etc. We're just exposing it and you have to say, I don't care that it's untrusted. That's probably okay. And that, that's why showing it is important. Then you, you can have a CSFS and say, I don't care. Uh, echo one, I don't care. And then it works. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like the conclusion here, uh, Lucas, was expose the fact that it's not signed. Just uh, have another file that says whether it's signed or not. So I think opt okay. in so you can echo one to opt in. Oh, okay. Per device. So don't don't expose the measurements at all unless you've echoed one in before you attempted to authenticate oh, and get the measurements in the first place. I was, was going to say, like, why opt in? Just, just show us unsigned, and you, you can read that or not. What, what's the opt in for? <laughs> Bad software. Bad software. Yeah. We'll make a mistake and read it. <laughs> uh, this, this is Linux. We give people the rope to hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is Linux user space. <laughs> <laughs> Anything could happen. Okay. So um, another feature that I will be working on is exposure of these certificates. Again, there are eight slots here. So I think what would, uh, my, my expectation is that the slot zero will be provisioned by the manufacturer of the device and the upper seven slots are available. As I have, okay, there is a question in the back. Lucas, we were just making the point as well. We've got about seven minutes, although technically there's a break. No, uh, I but people think, will I roll off the coffee. There's a question. No, we're we're already way beyond. Uh, I think we only had a uh, forty-five minutes, right? Uh, there is a oh, break. Okay, so sorry, anyone, I got the time anyone... wrong. It's breaks now. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, assuming the manufacturer would put a certificate in slot zero is a bad assumption. Okay. Well, no, it was just an example, just, so I don't really. I agree. Alice Harris is agreeing, right? This is stupid. But, but. <laughs> I 
just look at the question. So SPDM allows for not using certificates, but using this pressured PSK keys. So do you support that? Uh, no, uh, unless someone comes along and says, I need that. No one has shouted yet. So <laughs> that's, I mean, I think that's heavily used in some of the later TDIS bits, but that's stacked way up on top of sure? this bit. I think there is there's something that required them. It might not be called, I think it's called PSK. I don't remember what it stands for, but it, it, it's mm, like you it's can, pre pre I think it's pressure key, but so, so instead of using certificate chains, you can directly provision the, the key. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. this is for some controlled infrastructures. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so People what have have you like? Yep, go ahead. So I was just oh. saying, Lucas, maybe, maybe that's one for later. Um, okay. Along with many I, other things. I think so. I think so. Um, so what I have learned from the discussions with Alistair is that um, it, in real life, a, a, a for example, a cloud service provider might not be interested in using the manufacturer's certificate for um, validating the, the, uh, the authenticating the device. Uh, a cloud service provider might set up their own CA and uh, they might want to distribute uh, certificates to each device when they install it in their data center. And uh, so the certificate in the kernel's keyring would actually be um, a, a root certificate of that CA, of that cloud service provider's own CA. And basically the idea I think is that um, the cloud service provider can prevent uh, someone from attaching an arbitrary device in the data center uh, because they are able to uh, verify, okay, this device was provisioned uh, by us. Um, it has a valid certificate which is signed by our CA. And uh, I think that would be a use case for these unused slots. And uh, Alistair tells me that it's a, an important use case and that we need to support that. So what I think, or, or my, my proposal is that we will have this certificates um, subdirectory in SysFS, which is, exposes these slots. So you can read these slots and retrieve the certificate chain, and you can just feed that to OpenSSL to parse it. And you can also write something to these files, to these attributes, and that will automatically provision that certificate chain uh, into that slot uh, by triggering a set certificate exchange. Um, basically, there would be, is there a question? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, here's a question. Uh, the, the slots, what you read and what you write will be different because the, the certificate chain you write can't, is not the same chain that you read because you can only write some of it if you're using alias certs. Um, right. So that's a question for Linux. Is that confusing? Was that allowed or is, does it not matter? So I'm not sure if everyone understood well, that. It's a, because yeah, that's, so that's a wrinkle, that's a wrinkle of the SPDM specification. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the SPDM in a nutshell. Um, so basically if you have an alias cert device, you when you read the certificates, you get the whole chain. So root CA all the way down to the device. When you set certificate, you only set the first kind of few of them you can't you don't set the whole chain the device will generate some on the device so is it i think it's kind of confusing to users that you read you know seven certificates but you can only set three um but maybe linux doesn't care because yeah it's you have to figure a, it out yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of an ugly interface yeah, maybe. give user space to be able to hang itself i mean like let me say like it, we, we put that in the, in the abi documentation <laughs> Right. So this is basically, this is only, uh, this is a feature which, which was added in SPDM 1.2. This, this is called alias uh, certificates. And basically it means that the device, there, there is a little CA on the device itself and the device can create uh, sub-certificates. And when you retrieve the certificate chain, it contains all those sub-certificates. So personally, I think it's fine that there is this incongruence between reading and writing that attribute. Could, could you just have an alias list and then and the normal list and just have two attributes?
I think set alias is optional in SVM. It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. So you yeah. just wouldn't expose. So it might not that. work in some devices. It's just... Well, you might not be able to write. It's perfectly yeah. valid to have no write support at all because the certs are burnt in via fuses or whatever. I don't know. Hey. So, I mean, all of these interfaces, if we don't support it, then it will be the usual SysFS tweaking to make it clear that that file doesn't do anything. It's not writable or even there at all. <laughs> And if a reset is required to set certificate, what do we do? Do we just reset the device or do we return an error? Um, yeah. 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 So you, you get the response. You get the response. The, like, this device will send response is error reset required. Okay. We, we, we have this That's in some possible. interfaces already for, for like uh, updating firmware. It's like you, you staged it and you got to trigger it mm. with a reset. Uh, we, 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 yeah, it would, it would be nice if it would be nice if SPDM told us that we were going to get the error code ahead of time. Uh, it does. It okay. Does tell you it does. Well, it tells you it, tells you it might be. Okay. It so tells you to expose that. Too. It tells you it might be possible. Might be required. May, might yeah. be means always. Yeah. Um, okay. that was easy. <laughs> Simpler okay. interface. Right. It's stupid hardware. So, <laughs> so that's an that's an error which is returned from the device in response to the set certificate request. So it returns a reset required error, and but I think that's not a problem. We have in, an internal API in the PCI core, and uh, it is fairly easily. It is easy for us to trigger a conventional reset of the PCI device and then re-authenticate the device when it comes back. So it's possible to handle that. It's not a problem. It's, it's also in the the um, capabilities, right? The capability should say reset required right. in memory. So I'd, can we push I, it to user space? Just expose it as reset will be required on this device. And when user space programs this, the tooling needs to know that it needs to trigger a reset. We can handle that yeah, in the yes. kernel. Yeah. Well, cool. we can, but do we want to? Just because you've programmed the thing doesn't mean you instantly want to reset. Yeah. You might be programming it for next reset. Yeah, and, and again, please uh, think transport independent. There's not just PCI in the picture. There's more. I, I hear a reviewer volunteering. And we might want to stage the firmware update, stage the certificate, right? Do a whole bunch of things and then hit the reset button. Yep. And, and yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not easy, always okay. easy on PCI either. It's a bit random. Lucas, I think we should uh, wrap up to give people 15 minutes to grab a coffee before the next one. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, four, okay, I mean, 14 um, minutes. I'm nearly. I'm James nearly drinks quickly. Here. What? Okay. Don't worry. I mean, I'm, I'm nearly through here. Um, basically, the only remaining bullet points is that there will be a CSR attribute and you just read from that to get a, a certificate signing request, which you hand to your CA and then you get the certificate back from, from the CA and then you write that to one of these slots. So that's, that's all. And um, another feature that is a bit distant is, um, so I am looking into uh, establishing this encrypted channel with a device. And uh, that would be beneficial because for devices which do not support signed uh, measurements, once we transport them over an encrypted channel, uh, they will be signed implicitly. So I think um, that would be a mitigation for these um, devices which do not support that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you say Diffie-Hellman key exchange. You mean DHE key exchange, right? It's, it's Diffie-Hellman ephemeral, not Diffie-Hellman. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a bit sloppy, <laughs> okay. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's already the last slide. Um, these are the features that I'm going to work on. Uh, I appreciate all your feedback. Thanks so much. There is the... Lucas, I, I guess we'll do the usual thing and try and send an email out summarizing what the feedback was to make sure we captured everything and just send it to you. Well, if you captured it in the shared notes, we can attach it to the session and everything. And that have a that works even better, although I suspect we haven't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> If you just render the notes to text, you can upload it into the Indico system and it'll appear with your session.
We'll try. We'll email out as well. For those who will never find it. Thanks, Lucas. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks.